What's up, New Covenant? You know, I've been coming here. I was telling him, I think the first time we came, y'all were meeting in the other building. I think it was 1993. That's 30 years ago. How many of you here 30 years ago? Raise your hand. I love it. Just a few of you. How many of you be here if the Lord tarries 30 years from now? Come on. There you go. Well, you know, I've been coming 30 years is my point. But I suspect every time I've come, I've started the service the same way. I'm in a different city and state every week. I always start the same way, and I start with a question. Because it just helps me to understand the demographic that I'm dealing with. So what I need to know is, how many happy people do I have this morning? Wave your hand like this if you're happy. Okay, some of you didn't wave your hand. Anytime people do that, I never know if they're not actually happy or they're just out of the will of God. So if you're happy, wave your hand again like this. Good, 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 good. Like your goofy cousin would. Yeah, go lay there. Uh, man, I'm so glad to be here. I look forward to this time of the year, every year. It's such a wonderful thing to come here. And how many of you know, we get to hear your pastor over there on the B3. <laughs> and I love Pastor Dave when he plays because he plays on the black and the white keys, y'all. He's got it going on. So tonight's going to be a good night. Look at your neighbor and say, tonight's the night. Say it again. Tonight's the night. Say this. Today's the day. How many of you glad today's the day? I mean, wouldn't it be a drag if it was yesterday? We're all here today. And how many of you know outside of these walls, that's frequently the way it is. You're at a place and it's not today. In other words, you say, I, I'd like, today's buy one, get one. Oh, that was last week. I want the all-you-can-eat shrimp. Oh, I'm sorry, that's only on Tuesdays. Oh, I, is, is it buy one, get one? No, no, I'm sorry. We, we had a run on shrimp. It's just straight up. How many of you know in the world, it isn't always right now? But in the economy of God... It's always right now. Say it, today's the day. So today is the day. Tonight's the night. I just want to echo what Pastor said. If you have somebody that doesn't know Jesus, and I want to say you all do. Some of you relate to him. Might be one of your kids. Might be your dad. Might be your mom. Might be your husband or your wife. If you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus, how many of you know, how many of you love them enough that you want to see them go to heaven? Wouldn't you invest some time to see that come to pass. And here's what I've learned. If you'll just get them here, God does the rest. It's not up to you to do anything but get them here. Say this to me. All I have to do is get them here. Now, how many of you know it doesn't do it again for you to drop them off? you got to come to get them here. So let's say it again. Tonight's the night. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to say something else that he said because I thought this needs to be repeated. Didn't that praise and worship team do a wonderful job? Come on, they did better than that. You know, when you come here in the mornings, you may wonder, will the Smiths be here? You think Bobby will be there? Will Annie be there? You know what you've never wondered when you've come here? Will the praise and worship be anointed? You've never concerned yourself with that because you know every time you come, they've been faithful to prepare. Their hearts are ready. And they help lead us in, and that's wonderful. So give them another hand. They did an excellent job. Man, this stage full of all these young men and women, that's really, really cool. Well, you know, Pastor said it is Father's Day. Uh, I, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in church, um, and then uh, was a season of my life. I was, my father was a preacher, 63 years he preached. My grandfather was a preacher, 78 years he preached. 63 years, 78 years, I was a hell raiser. <laughs> Just full disclosure, I was rebellious. How many of you here ever rebellious? And the rest of you are still liars. Well, that's fine. We, we all have our thing, I understand, but mine was rebellion. And so it's incredible to me that I'm standing before you this morning. I, I told my wife a few years ago, I said, you know, we ought to change the name of our ministry to God Will Forgive Anybody. Because as I stand before you, that is the absolute thing that is blinking in neon. I'm living proof. God will forgive anybody. And I'm so thankful that he revealed his call and plan that he would had for my life from the beginning. He didn't reveal it to me until I got born again. And, and part of that thing was just knowing that God had called me to exhort men. To exhort women. And we're today looking at men. We're talking about men. We're talking about fathers. You know, C.S. Lewis, the great author, he said something that's profound. He said, fatherhood is something that comes upon you with no real inquisition as to your readiness for it. And he said, that is the reason why we have so many fathers with children, but so few children with fathers. How many know just because you got kids don't make you a dad? 
any more than just because you got testosterone makes you a man. Fatherhood is a choice. Fatherhood is a choice. How many of you have learned this? Love is a choice. Love is a person. But for you and me, where the rubber meets the road, where our flesh is at, love is a decision. How many of you know it goes beyond bam, bam, bam in your heart? How many married men? Raise your hand if you're a married man. How many brothers in the struggle? All right, quite a few. Uh, how many of you remember the first time you saw your wife? This would be a good time to raise your hand, guys. How many of you, you might want to raise both of them, in fact. You know, I, I remember when I saw my wife the first time, didn't know who she was. I was playing in the Atlanta Civic Center downtown, and she wasn't born again. And by the way, if you're not born again, what road do you sit on? The back, that's right. So I don't know if you guys are in violation of code or what, but... She came in, and the, and the lights were dark. All that were lighting the back back there were those exit signs like y'all have there over the doors. But I remember when she walked in, I saw her from, I don't know, 200, 300 foot away. And I remember looking back there and going, in the name of Jesus, I received that. I didn't have to fast and pray. I knew that cranks my tractor right there. That works. Yes, indeed. But, you know, when I met her and, and, and then things had to happen for me to be able to fall in love with her and for her and I to be in agreement. And one of those things was the decision and the choice that goes beyond feelings, that goes beyond emotions. How many of you know feelings are all over the page? You love somebody today. You know, I love you, darling. I love our life together. It's wonderful. I appreciate all you've given me. He snores at night. And you hear a voice that says, hit him with a rock. Just kill him. Hit him with a rock. Nobody will know. And that's the deal with emotions. That's the deal with passion. It's all over. But love is a choice. Being a father is a choice. You know, kids tend to be able to cut things right to the bone. Uh, I, I, I've been doing ministry now myself 44 years. And the first 10 years of that was in staff ministry down in Atlanta. And one Sunday, our children's church worker, we found out about 20 minutes before service, was not going to be able to be there. How many of you know, you don't look at somebody 20 minutes before and say, you know, could you go teach 85, 5 to 9-year-olds? Uh, so I went in there. Uh, I didn't have any donuts or nothing. Nothing to arm me at all. But I had a built-in subject matter. It was Father's Day, just like today. And so I got in there and I asked the kids, remember now, 5 to 9-year-olds. About 100 of them. I said, uh, can anybody tell me what is today? Oh, 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 Mr. Kim. Yes. I said, wait, it's Father's Day. I said, that's right. I said, can anybody tell me what is Father's Day? And this little girl, how many of you have ever met a five-year-old that's like a 35-year-old? Her name was Elizabeth. They called her Lizzie. Lizzie raised her hand. I knew this was going to be deep. I said, Lizzie, explain to the rest of us what is Father's Day. She said, well, Father's Day is pretty much like Mother's Day. You just don't spend as much. Look it up in Webster's. That's what it says. I thought that needs to go straight into the dictionary. That sums it up right there. But I just want to honor all of our fathers and bless you guys. Uh, yeah, give another hand to our men. Mm. You know, when you do what I do and you're, you're in large groups of people, by and large, I either make a, a living with my mouth or a guitar in my hand, sometimes both. But when I look out across an audience, I see here today some of you that are in your teens. And then I look out here and I see some of you pushing 40. <laughs> That's a pretty broad spectrum. So the challenge for somebody like myself is, what can I say that will keep the attention of a 17-year-old and a 47-year-old? Because that's pretty broad. How many know there's very few things that will keep the attention of a 17-year-old? And a 47-year-old. And so I got to thinking, what, what is something we can all relate to? And I got to thinking about footsteps. Footsteps. Footsteps is something that all of you do. You all take footsteps. You all have taken footsteps over your lifetime. How many of you here have parented a kid and you remember their first steps? Maybe you took pictures. Maybe you took videos. That's a big deal. But footsteps continue to be a big deal for the whole of your life. Everybody look at me. Because when you left today, when you got up today, whether or not you had a smile in your face or you were hanging your head, were because of your footsteps. Everything that's happening in your life right now is a culmination of the steps you've taken to get you to where you are. If you're somewhere you wish you weren't, 
I saw a guy with a t-shirt that said, just pretend I'm not here. That's what I'm doing. That's the way a lot of people live their life. Pretending they're not where they are. Well, why are you there? Because of your footsteps. And so what I want to talk to you briefly about today is your footsteps. Where are you at and where are you going? Where are you at and where are you going? Where you're at is a function of the choices that you've made. Every time you've come to an intersection, every time you've had the opportunity to go different ways, you've always gone in the direction of your most dominant thought. Your thought life governs your footsteps. You want to change your life? You want to change the direction your life is going? What you're going to have to change is your thought life. Wave your hands. I know that's right. Now, how many of you know one of the simple truths, one of the biblical principles we have to live by is you can't change your mind. Until you get your heart changed. You can't change your mind until you get your heart changed. That's the beautiful thing. If you're here today and you want to change the direction of your life. And you realize your thoughts are robbing you. You realize your thoughts are what are getting you into trouble. You realize your thoughts are what are creating these circumstances that you're so displeased with. The good news is you can change all of that. If you get your heart changed. And only God. Say only God. Only God can do that. He can do what you can't do for yourself. He can change your heart. Let me hear you say, imagine that. One of the scriptures that I thought of that came to my mind immediately about footsteps is found in Psalms. Put that verse up for us if you would, brother. The first verse I gave you. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. How many of you have heard this verse before? If you've been around church long, you've heard it. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I remember the first time I heard that. I hadn't been saved long, but uh, to be forthright with you, my first thought was, that ain't me. That says the steps of a good man. The adjective there is good. And I remember thinking, I ain't good. Had been good. I was rebellious. I told you that. I was one of those people who would only come to church back in the day if there was Easter poinsettias, or here's, excuse me, Christmas poinsettias or Easter lilies. That's about the only time I came to church was I thought I was doing my favor to my parents. And I remember when I'd come in, you'll have to have faith to believe this. I had hair down to here. I used to dress wild. I loved to shock church people. Truth be told, I still do. And I remember when I would come in, I called them the committee of the concern. The ushers would look at me. Immediately, they'd all look at me, and I could hear them talking to themselves, and I'd hear somebody go, who's that? And somebody said, that's a clown. And then they'd come over and get me like they're cutting a cow out of the herd. And before long, I called on the committee that concerned all those ushers. They'd have me over in the corner, and they were all right in my face. And I said, where you been, boy? You was in that club last night, weren't you, boy? Playing that loud guitar of yours, were you? <laughs> yeah, that's where you were. I bet it was hot in there, wasn't it, son? Hot and sweaty. Were they dancing in there? I remember thinking... Were you there? Because, <laughs> man, you're spot on. I didn't even see you. They said, you're in there, weren't you? Hot and sweaty. He said, you know what else is hot, boy? Hell! <laughs> that was my experience to church. I grew up in a church where they were so legalistic, it seemed like everything was fun, send me to hell. You know what I'm saying? Were you in that movie theater, Kim? Yeah, Hell. Are you dancing? Sort of. Hell. I mean, boom, hell. And so I grew up believing, I'm not a good person. And then the Lord said, read the next verse. Verse 24. He says, though he fall, he shall not be cast down. For what does the Lord do? He upholdeth him with his right hand. He said, son, you missed where the action is in those two verses. It isn't in the first one, it's in the second one. Because he said, first of all, ain't nobody good but me. You know, some of y'all may be sitting out there thinking, I've never been rebellious. I wouldn't know the difference in vodka and water. There is a difference. I've never said a curse word. I've always been to church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
One time I had a friend of mine and she was speaking at the National Women's Aglow Conference. She's the keynote speaker at the largest gathering of women in the entire United States. And she said right before her, a woman got up and shared her testimony. And the woman shared how from the time she's a little girl, she'd been abused sexually and she'd been done wrong and put into sex trafficking, all this, and later got addicted to drugs and then became a prostitute. And she said she shares this whole terrible history and then shares but then Jesus saved me and she said I'm thinking over here I got to follow this and she said I, I'm the keynote speaker but she says you know I, I've never smoked a cigarette and I, I don't know what whiskey is and I don't cuss and the Lord said daughter I had to forgive you of a far worse sin than her for I had to forgive you of self-righteousness I thought it was pretty bold that she even shared that with me, that the Lord had kind of spanked her like that. And that was an encouragement to me because I thought I'm the only one who's messed up. I'm the one that everybody knew was screwing up. I'm the one that everybody knew was trouble. But the Lord said, you know what? Not a one of you were good, but for me. But once I redeem you, you all can become good. You see, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord because though he fall. How many of you here love Jesus? How many of you here want to serve him with your whole heart? Amen. And in spite of that, how many of you here have sinned? How many of you here have done the same sin more than once? How many of you here have done it more than twice? Yeah, right. So how many of you know that would disqualify all of us from being good? But you see, the Lord said to me, son, here's the deal. He says, I can direct and use for your good Every step you've taken. That's good news. Let me also, that's good. Say it like Andy Griffith, y'all. Let me also, that's good. Those kids over there Googling, who's Andy Griffith? <laughs> Say it again, that's good. It is good that he can use any of your steps. The Lord said to me, the steps you took in rebellion, the steps that you took that you thought were trying to get you as far away from me as you could get. He said, it didn't work. He says, you can't get away from me. Amen. I'm with you. And he said, when you've fallen, when you've done wrong, my hand is still upon you. Yeah. See, I used to think his hand was upon me with a ball-peen hammer going, boom, hell. <laughs> How many of you remember, you may have to have gray hair or no hair. How many of you remember recess? That's what they called it, recess. The bell would ring, recess. Oh, all was good. And many of you here were thinking, Oh, man, I'm rich today. I got a quarter. I mean, if you had a quarter back in the 60s, it's on me. Around for everybody, bartender. It's on me. I've got to go and lay my quarter down on the table there. Because how many of you know you had a quarter, you could buy maybe two Cokes and a bag of them peanuts. And how many of you know you could pour the peanuts down one bag of Coke? How many of y'all ever did that? <laughs> Glory to God. Don't judge. Don't judge. Try it. But how many of you were so prepared, you had that quarter, you're so excited, then you went, oh, no. I mean, you're right up there at the front of the line, and you realize, I left my quarter in my desk. And so you went to go get your quarter, and when you come back, what did the kids say? You got out of line. You go to the back. No, you, know, you got out. You go to the back. How many of those people grew up to be church people? <laughs> Come on, y'all. Don't start acting pious on me now, now. You know we're quick to send people to the back. How I many of you know God will never send you to the back of the line? Never. No, what he does is he said, hey, you got out of line? I know it. He said, get back in where you got out. I held your place. You see, when you fall, the Lord upholds you with his right hand. Say it again, Andy. It is good. And then the Lord quickened me to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Psalm 139 kind of tells the story of me and I believe each of your lives. Because first of all, he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and you what? How many of you have ever been somewhere and somebody, Oh, I know him. And you go, what's his name? Well, I mean, I don't know his name, but I work with him. You know, we, we all call him, uh, I don't know his name. But how many of you, when God says he know you, he knows you. He knows you. And you know how he knows you? Look what it says. He searches you. 
Boy, how many of you know if God searches you, you've been searched. How many of you ever raised a teenager? How many of you here searched them? You know, come in, turn to the left, turn to the right, show the tattoo. I mean, that was the kind of the deal. It was like going into prison and getting your pictures made. When I came home, my, my parents you know, had the wand, man, take him up and down, check there, check that. How many of you know when God searches you, he knows the stuff your parents don't know? Hey, the stuff your parents will never know. He knows. Look at the next verse. He says, you know when I sit and when I rise. And what else does he know? Everything you're thinking. Imagine if everybody in this room knew what you were thinking right now. Hey, let's keep it simple. Imagine if the person next to you knew what you were thinking right now. <laughs> they may, I don't even know who you are anymore. That's what you're thinking? Think it again. God knows and has always known everything you're thinking. Now, I know some of y'all are thinking what I used to think. Hell. I'm going to hell. Give me the pitchfork. Give me a tail. I'm going to hell. Look at verse 3. He says, you discern my going out and my lying down. And what is he familiar with? What do you think he meant by all? Now, how many of you know, we all have some ways we want everybody to be familiar with, don't we? I mean, it's on our business card. If you need these ways, call me. I'm a way maker. Call me for these ways. It's on your website. It's on your Facebook page. Here are my ways. But how many of you know, you all have ways. And on that Facebook page, are they? If I'm talking a little out of schools because I've never been on social media in my life, I promise you. People are like, you don't do Instagram? Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, MyFace, whatever. I don't do any of them. And they said, why not? I said, I don't need another way to disappoint people. I'm already slow answering voicemails and texts and emails and everything else. I don't need another way to disappoint people. Let's just keep it simple. But you all have ways that are top secret. And yet, he knows them. Look at verse 4. Your mouth. Your mouth. How many of you here have ever been told your mouth is a problem? How many of you here did not have to be told? You knew it going in. How many of you here told everyone else? My mouth, full disclosure, my mouth could be a problem. Yeah. You know, the Lord told Jeremiah, he revealed to Jeremiah the call that he had on his life when Jeremiah was just a kid. He said, I've called you before your mother's womb to build up and to tear down, to create and to destroy, to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah was like, uh, 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 I mean, that sounds good. I like all that. The prophet to the nations thing in particular kind of cranks my tractor. But I'm thinking you might have me confused with somebody else because I'm just a child. And I don't even know how to talk. How many of you know that was a lie? Because he interrupted God to talk to him. And then the Lord looked at him, what he often has said to me, and he said, I can see right now your mouth's going to be a problem. And the Lord told Jeremiah, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to touch your mouth. And I'm going to put my words in your mouth. How many know some things in your life could change right now? If you got his words in your mouth. Imagine what that would do for your marriage. <laughs> Theme from Jeopardy. Imagine what that could do for your marriage if you got his words in your mouth. Imagine what that could do for your relationship with your kids if you got his word in your mouth. Imagine what that could do for the relationship with your parents if you got his words in your mouth. Because the Lord says, I already know what's in your mouth. I know every word before you speak it. Then we all say, Shazam. How many know that's in the New Redneck translation? Shazam and Golly are both in there. I don't know if you've seen it. Look at verse 5. He says, you hem me in behind and before. 
How many of you remember pinball? Again, you can, you can tell I'm going back, y'all. This is Throwback Sunday. How many of y'all remember pinball? How many of you remember when you'd go into clubs, there was pinballs? I think you'd have five, six pinball machines lined up, truck stops and clubs or whatever, restaurants. And if you're not familiar with the game or you've never seen it, the object of pinball, you've got a little thing you pull back, and boom, it shoots the ball out. And you've got two little flappers now that you control. And your responsibility is to keep that ball going. Every time it starts to come down here and go into the gutter, you take your little sticks and boom, you hit it out there, your little what, what, flappers. You hit it with your flappers. How many know the problem is flappers don't meet? There's actually room where the ball can go and down the gutter. But how many of you know no matter how hard you hit that ball, there are bumpers out there. That's what they're called, electrically charged bumpers. Every time you hit them, you get points. That's the object. Hit the bumpers as many times as you can. How many of you know no matter how hard you hit that ball, the bumpers kept it hemmed in? And the Lord spoke to me one day and he said, Son, you know when you were running from me, how many of you ever run from God? You remember when you were running from me, when that was your whole thing? You remember when your mantra was pretty simple? It was one word, party! I'm not the only one who said that, y'all. Let me hear y'all say it on three. One, two, three. Party. I like how y'all are saying that like you've never said it before. <laughs> say it again on three. One, two, three. Party. I mean, that was my deal. Party! Because I thought when I was partying, I was as far away as I could get from all the laws, all the legality, all the structure, all the, you can't do that. Hell! You know what the Lord said to me? He said, when you were running for me, when you were at Penny of Beer Night, I was right there. And what did he say he was doing with his hand, y'all? Put your hand out there in front of you. Hold it out like this. If you're not holding your hand out there, you're out of the will of God. Hold it out there. <laughs> back row, put it out there. Thank you. He was doing that look like, I'm untouchable. I'm back here. No, not when I'm here. Reach out there. Take your hand. <laughs> His wife said, you listen to him. Take your hand out there. How many of you know that's the way God is doing to you all the time? When you've made your worst mistakes, when you've done the things you're most ashamed of, that you don't want anybody to know? When you've had the greatest failures you've ever had? He isn't up there going, boom, hell. Look at me. He's had his hand on you. And he's never taken it off. That's why it's good news. That's why if you're a dad today and you've not been the dad, you should have been. If you've been like C.S. Lewis said, you can change that today. And the good news is there's no forms to fill out. You don't need a pen. You don't need a password. All you need is the ability to say yes. When you say yes to him, he can change everything in your life that you can't. Because all along, where's his hand been? Upon you. Say it, Andy. Look at verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to even attain. I can't wrap my head around it. I couldn't believe that all the things that I did, God still wanted to use me. I went to my 10th high school reunion. How many of you here went to any of your reunions? Did you enjoy it? No. I haven't decided yet. The jury's still out. I mean, it was 40 years ago, but I still kind of shocked, you know, because I went, you know... Yeah. First thing that I thought was a little suspect, we had to fill out a form of what we were doing now 10 years later. They did it at the Peachtree Plaza Hotel. I went to high school in Norcross out here in Gwinnett County. And uh, they did it at the Peachtree Plaza Hotel. And it was really nice. They had a huge big screen like that. And the DJ would announce our name, and they would have us go stand in front of our graduation picture. <laughs> I knew right then there's dirty work afoot here. Someone should be drawn and quartered for that alone. We had to go stand there. And while we were standing there, the guy would read what we were doing now 10 years later. Now here's Albert. He is now an engineer with Michelin Tire. He's Cindy. She owns her own chain of, uh, uh, you know, hair products, whatever. Here's Kim Clout, a minister of the gospel. The whole room went whew, quiet. And then somebody went... <coughs> And he started laughing. 
And, and I heard one girl say, she says, I'm surprised he didn't write he was a monk. Because they thought I had put down the most ridiculous thing, what I would never do. And then I heard people go, you mean he really is? And I had countless people come. My wife said, what kind of a person were you? I had all these people come to me and go, you are a preacher? And they said what I said to you before. They said, man, if God will forgive you, he'll forgive anybody. And I thought, that's the truth. Maybe that's why I'm in ministry. I am proof that if God will forgive me, he'll forgive any of you. His hand is upon you. It is, I can't even wrap my head around it, that he would use me. How many of God rarely uses the most intelligent person? The most gifted, the most enlightened. How many of you know most people God used where people said, huh, I don't want to, I can't, I don't ever, I can't use him. But God said, no, no, in your weakness, my strength's made perfect. Look at verse 7. He said, where can I go to get away from you? How many of you, I asked you before, I'm going to have you commit, don't lie in church. Don't lie in church. How many of you have run from God? Yes. And you've wondered yourself, where can I go to get away from you? Look at the next verse. He said, if I go to the heavens, what? Well, Shazam. I mean, well, that's a rookie mistake. If you're running from God, don't run to heaven. <laughs> Clearly, he's there. But then look in the next line. If I make my bed, what? In the depths. The King James says, if I make my bed in the depths of hell. How many of you here have ever made your bed in the depths of hell? Your mama's not looking. Go ahead and raise your hand. Uh huh. Some of you are wondering, have I? Well... Have you ever woke up and looked at the person next to you and said three words you thought you would never say? And you are, that's the bed of the depths of hell. Where you've got up and gone, whose pants are these? Look at the next verse. Look at verse 9. He said, if I get up on the wings of dawn. How many of you guys know where the noisy places are on the floor at your house? He's giggling, you know why? Because he does. He knows where every guy does. That's proof you are a guy. How many of you have ever tried to get up early in the morning and get out before anybody knows? And you're going, there's that noisy place. Step around that. Here's the chair. You don't even turn the lights on, of course. And you're moving and you're creeping. And that's what the psalmist said. If I get up on the wings of the dawn, just so I can get on the far side of the sea. If I can go to get as far away as I can from you. Look at verse 10. Even there. What's he doing with his hand now? Put it out there in front of you. Sir, you knew I'd look. That's right. Put it out in front of you. What's he doing with his hand? Everybody in this section, all of you, tell me. What's God doing with his hand in your life right now? What's he always been doing? Guiding. How about over there? What's God doing with his hand in your life right now? Guiding. How about over there? Guiding. How about the lob, uh, the uh, balcony? Thank you. <laughs> Delighted to have you all with us today. <laughs> Everybody in the room, what's God been doing with his hand all along? Guiding. See, even when you thought you could get away, he's hemmed you in behind the book. That's why you're here this morning. I'm not the only one telling this story. Some of y'all are shocking proof he'll forgive anybody. And some of you are that proof in waiting. And today can be your day. That your life changes. The direction of your life changes because the footsteps you take change. My wife and I have horses. And my wife is a wonderful Bible teacher and she uses horses as the object lesson. I'm going to share a little bit with you at the end about that. One thing we've learned about horses. Anybody here own horses? Raise your hand if you own horses. I'm reminded of that old Bible hymn, No, Not One. No, did I see that hand? You have horses? How many you have? Just one. He has a horse. You ever had more than one? What's the most you've ever had? Seven. Just the reason I'm asking is this. Did you get them all at once or did you slowly add? That's what I figured. So here's the deal. You had that one horse, two horses. You bring a new one in. Vouch for me on this. If you know anything about horses, when you bring in a new horse, everything stops. If you've got five horses and you bring a new one in, everything stops and they all go. You 
see this over here? I'm looking too. Because I want to, there's somebody new. Am I telling the truth? That's exactly what they do. They all stop. Why? Well, because in the world of horses, somebody is going to be alpha. And when they see a new horse come in, what they have to have answered immediately, if not sooner, is where are you going to fit in in the hierarchy? In other words, when you step up to the water trough, am I going to act like I don't even see you? Or as soon as I see you come in my direction, I, it's all yours. It's all yours. Because that is the world of horses. Here's what's incredible. Horses, from the time they are born, have more sense than most human beings. And I'm going to explain why. Everybody look at me. I want you to get this. When horses and most herbivores are born. By the way, what is a herbivore? Plant eaters. As opposed to carnivores. What do carnivores eat? <laughs> Glory to God. Let's all just take a minute, y'all. I felt my baby jump within me when he said that. Let's all just stop. How many of y'all know there's some problems in life only barbecue can solve? And the ones that don't solve it makes it better, doesn't it, brother? That's right. Of course, carnivores eat meat. What they actually eat is herbivores. Carnivores eat herbivores. And herbivores know that. And that is because when herbivores are born, horses, sheep, Zebra, gazelles, all the animals on the African plains. The minute they're born, they have every one of their senses in place as if though they were an adult. In other words, they can see as they could see as an adult. They can hear as they can hear when they're an adult. Compare that and contrast that with human babies. How many know when they're born, they can't basically see at all? Can't speak, can't do anything. And for that matter, neither can their parents. Talking about Father's Day. Have you ever been at a hospital over there where all the newborns are and you got dads? You know, he's like, oh, he's beautiful. He looks like my dad. And they go, sir, that's not yours. Yours is over here. <laughs> because how I many know they all look the same without the little card? You know, they all look like lizards. <laughs> and these baby herbivores have every one of their senses intact. Boom, from the moment they hit the ground. And that's why the minute they're born, it is literally within the hour they're up and walking. They're up and running. You ever seen a baby horse run? They look like their feet aren't even touching the ground. They look like they're just floating. It's incredible. I'm serious. They're unbelievable. Why is that? Because if they're not up, if they're not moving, if their feet aren't moving, they will be eaten by the predators. As a consequence, look at me. Look at me, church. From the moment that horse hits the ground and is born, they begin looking for leadership. Because the key to their survival is leadership. This is why I say they got more sense than most humans. How many of you were looking for leadership when you were born? How many of you are looking for leadership now? No. You're not the boss of me. I don't have to. Not a horse, because they know their preservation, their lifespan is hooked to their ability to follow the leader. That's why when you bring a new horse in, they got to know, are you going to be the leader or is it going to be me? And how do they determine who's going to be the leader? How many know in the human world, how do we determine who's going to be the leader? How many know everybody that claims to be a leader is not? Amen. And we can see that in the highest places in government in our country right now. But horses are remarkable. They figure it out, boom, like that. Their life depends on being able to read body language. When you were a kid and somebody put you on a horse and you didn't know anything, he knew what you didn't know before you knew you didn't know it. He knew. He can look at you up and down. He's not a leader. And horses look at one another. But if you have two and there seems to be a difference of opinion and they both think they're leader, they'll come nose to nose. You can hear them <laughs> sniffing. And then one of them will take just one step back. The minute that happens, it's decided. Because the way one horse shows another horse is I'm your leader, he moves their feet. I said he. Truth be told, it's usually a mare. Just being straight up, no, it's Father's Day, sorry. 
I mean, you know, the stallion just shows up for a while. And then he's back on his way. Mama's there to deal with all the fallout of that. And the mayor, the alpha mayor, she usually is the boss of the herd. And she may, it may be like that at your house. That's why when your kid's come and ask you, you go, I don't know, son, ask your mama. I, I, I just learned to use my prosthesis. I'm not going to get the other one yanked off. Those horses are able to discern who's going to be a leader by who can move the other one's feet. And that is why when you bring a new horse into your herd, we brought a new one in. We got him when he was seven months old. We saw him the day he was born. We would go to the barn three days a week. We saw him literally when he was an hour old. And when he was seven months old, we brought him home. And he was undersized. He grew up in a barn where they have 25 babies every year. He was the last one born. He was the littlest one. They all called him Tiny Tim. For those of you who grew up in the 60s, you remember Tiny Tim. They called him Tiny Tim, and they all started immediately deciding what he'll never be. Oh, he'll never do this. He'll never be able to do that. Blah, blah, blah. And my wife and I were like, well, you know, from the time I've looked at him, I felt an affinity for him. My wife said, me too. Through a remarkable turn of events. He came to live with us when he was seven months old. He was undersized. He looked about like a Labrador retriever. He's about that tall. And we brought him home. My wife said, no matter how big he is, she said, his name is not Tiny Tim. She says, I'm changing his name to Ariel. It's a Hebrew word, and it means Lion of God. She said, he'll never be afraid of anything. She said, but I'm going to be the one to teach him. She said, I'm going to teach him in life. The only thing he's got to fear is me. Because I'm his alpha. And how did I just tell you one horse tells another, I'm your boss? Moving their feet. Here's the deal. The moment we got him, she backed him onto our trailer. Backed. Step horses never taken a while. Backed him all the way up into the trailer. When she got him off, she backed him all the way off. When she brought him to our place, she backed him all the way down to the barn. As of right now, he's now four years old. He's not tiny anymore. He's 15 hands and he weighs 1,200 pounds. And he ain't nothing but muscle. But say every day. Every say every day. every day. Every day she brings him in to come into the stall at night. And every morning when she takes him out, she backs him out. She backs him in. You know what's cool? She don't have to tell him. When she opens the gate, he turns around. I'm ready to back, Mama. Now, even though he understands... How I many know oh, you have to constantly remind them? And that's why every day, say every day. So here's the deal. Every day, either I or his, his mama, my wife, have given him every bite of grain he has ever had in his lifetime. He has never once gone to Tractor Supply and procured it, stacked it in the truck, brought it home, stacked it in the barn, brought it out, put it in the bin for mama. He's never done that. He just eats it. When it's poured into his bin, he eats it. I'm through. Say every day. Every bite of hay he's ever had, either I or his mama's given it to him. He's never picked it up out of the field. He's never stacked it on the trailer. He's never driven it home, stacked it in the barn, and then brought one bale at a time down for mama. He's never done that. All he does is eat it when it's broke up nice in the corner in his stall. Say it every day. Never, ever has he taken the water hose and filled any of his buckets. In fact, he tries to be a problem when I'm doing it. He's never, ever procured his own drink of water. And yet every day, though every bite of grain, every bite of hay, every drop of water he's ever had has been given to him, he still wants to ask the same question every day. You know what it is? Who's going to be the boss? Is it going to be you or is it going to be me? I got to know. And there was a season when he began to mature, testosterone going through his body. I called it crack. I said, he's high on crack. That's his problem right now. And we realized we need to perform an issue here of subtraction. Those of you who have never grew up on a barn or in a farm, it was subtraction by the number two. I'll let you to connect the dots there. And we did that so he could think. He's on crack. And so here's the deal. Stay every day. Every day. You know what's really cool? I feed in the morning, and I go in, and he knows that I give grain to the other horses first, but he knows when his time in the order is. 
And when I come walking out of the feed room with his bucket of grain, I look at it in his stall. He backs up. Because it's his way of saying, I understand. See, here's the deal. If you want to be the alpha or horse, you have to be able to move his feet left and right, backwards and forward, whenever you tell him, I own you. There's no touch me, not spots on you. I own you. I can move you at will. And the Lord spoke to me. Remember, we're talking footsteps here. Whether you're a teenager or you're an adult, it dawned on me. Ariel understands that I'm his authority because I control his feet. Well, you know what? You could do a little deduction right now in your life. What is it that moves your feet? Because whatever it is that moves your feet, that's what has authority over you. You can change your life if you change your footsteps. Because whatever controls your feet controls you. Wave your hand and say, I know that's right. See, we get into problems because alcohol controls our feet. Because anger controls our feet. Because fear controls our feet. Because nicotine controls our feet. Because food controls our feet. Whatever governs your feet governs your life. Footsteps. You want to change your life? Change the steps you take. Here's what's incredible. God said, I can use what the devil intended to destroy you for your good. If you're seated out there today, it doesn't matter where you are. I don't know what you left when you left home this morning. I don't know if you got up with a smile on your face, like I said earlier, or everywhere you go, you got your head hanging. You know, I can tell people that think about themselves too much by their posture. Watch, and you'll be able to figure it out yourself. People who think about themselves too much, it's pretty obvious. They always bent over. Oh, God. They did 23 of me, and it came up with a picture of Eeyore. Oh, God, what's going to tear up next? i got to go to work tomorrow. Oh, Lord, my mother-in-law's coming over today. Oh, God. I mean, you know, that's why we start service with praise and worship. We're trying to help you get your mind off of you. That's what's been robbing you all these years. You think about you. Imagine if you thought about him. The Bible says if you can keep your mind stayed on him, He'll keep you in perfect peace. If you can keep your mind stayed on him, he'll keep you in perfect peace. And how many of you know if you keep your mind stayed on him, your feet will keep you in perfect peace, not in perpetual trouble. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Your feet, your footsteps. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. And though he fall, he'll not be cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his right hand. Beloved, as you're seated there, whether you've taken good steps or bad, and let's be real, we've all taken all of that. Be encouraged today. Because at every point, he's had his hand on you. It's why you're here today. You could have been anywhere on this Father's Day. You're here. It's because his hand is on you. He's hemmed you in behind it before. When you've tried to run and get away, you can get away from him, and you never will. We teach that to horses in a round pen. We set up a circle. We stand in the middle, and we make them move their feet. When you make them move their feet, their first thing is, run away! That's the way they deal with everything. But the more they run, they're not getting away. They're just running in a circle. And when they get tired and their tongue's hanging out, turn around and look, and you're right there where you were when we started. And eventually they learn, well, I don't have to run. Because if I just turn and face him, he lets me stop running. And when I turn and face him, he comes over and puts his hand on my head and tells me, it's all right. That's what God is saying to each of you today. You've been running. You've been trying to get away. Now your tongue's hanging out. Now you've got enough disasters that have befallen you. You're thinking, I'll never get out of this. 
But you found if you just turn and face him, you don't have to run anymore. And when you face him, and you take a step towards him, he puts his hand out, and he says, it's all right. I'm here for you. I can fix what you thought was forever broken. I can restore what you thought was forever lost. I'll bring life where all you've ever known is death. I'll bring hope where all you've ever known is despair. And I'll bring joy where all you've ever known is depression. Just face me. Come to me. Come to my feet. And I'll change you for eternity. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. There may be somebody here this morning. You don't need to be told how many mistakes you've made. You know, and God knows. You don't mean to me to tell you you're going to hell. You probably know that in your heart. And it's true. There is a hell. There is a judgment. But you don't have to go. Jesus went to hell so you don't have to. Jesus was beaten so you don't have to be. He took upon himself the consequence of your sin that you could be called the good man. That you could be called righteous. That you could be called the head and not the tail above and never beneath. If you've never experienced that, you've come to church, but you've never given him your heart. You've never admitted my life is broken, I'm a sinner, and I cannot fix it. I need a Savior. Lord, I give you my heart. If you've never done that, this entire day, everything that's happened in this service has been leading up to this moment for you. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. If you're here today and you're ready to say yes to him, think of all the things you've said yes to over your lifetime. But if you're ready to say yes to him and you want to see what he can do with your life, he's a promise keeper. He'll never tell you one thing and do another. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'll never lie. He'll never change his mind. And he has always seen the best possible you even when you were at your worst. If you're here today and you're ready to say yes to him, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you stand up. I'm not going to make you come to the front. I'm going to pray for you right where you're seated. Everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed. But if you know this was for you today, and you're ready to turn and face him, you want his hand upon you. If that's you, I want you to do something simple. Right where you're seated, just raise your hand. I just want to pray with you. Do it now. I see you. There's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Church pray. God's moving. Nine, ten. Church pray. God's moving. Eleven. I see you, sir. Twelve. I see you, ma'am. You can put him down. The night I said yes to Jesus, the man had to ask three times. And that's because I used to say to myself, I- I'm going to get saved, but I'm going to party till I'm 40. You know, then I'll, then, I'll, then I'll get saved. Three of my closest friends were all killed in the same automobile accident. We'd been partying all that day. It was a snow day. We were out of school. I had a date that night. They went to another party. They never made it home. They were all three killed in the same accident in front of our high school before one of them was 18. I realized I got no promise of tomorrow, and neither do you. I counted 12 people, I believe, that raised their hand. But there may be somebody else here that didn't. And just like that night when that man asked, he asked three times before I responded, I'm so glad he wasn't in a hurry, and I'm not either. Jesus died 2,000 years ago for you for this moment. We're not going to rush. You mattered to him when he was whipped. You mattered to him when he was scourged. He had his mind on you when he took his last breath. If you're here today and you haven't already raised your hand, 12 did. But if you haven't already raised your hand, but you know you should have, I want you to do it now. Just raise it where I can see it. Is there anybody else? 
Is there anybody else? Obey God if he's speaking to you. I see you. You can put it down. That's 13. Who else? I see you. That's 14, 15, 16. Church of God's moving. I see you over here on the side, 17. The Bible says when just one person says yes, every angel in heaven rejoices. We got 17 adults in here today who said, this is for me. I want my steps to be ordered to the Lord. I want to be good because of who he is. I can be. Here's what I want you to do. For all of you that raised, I counted 17. There may be some that I didn't see. It doesn't matter. God saw you. He's the one that matters. But if you raise your hand, I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me. In fact, I want everybody in the room to pray out loud with them. Father, I thank you for loving me. Say that again. Father, I thank you for loving me. When I was unlovable, when I was unlovely, thank you for loving me, for sending your son to die so I don't have to. By his shed blood, I believe I am now forgiven. By his shed blood, my past has been erased and I'll never look back. By his resurrection, I have eternal life. My best days are ahead of me. My life is ahead of me, and I'll never look back. Church, can we give God glory for these people this morning? Raise our hand. I live for that. That's awesome. Come on, give God glory for that. That's better than a national championship, y'all. Come on.